I've said to you so many times that in order to heal, we have to understand the design that God has given us. And also in order to develop, we need to understand the design that God has given us. So in this video, I'm going to be talking with you about the development of discernment based on our de design that God has given us, how we develop the ability to discern and test the spirit in others. We're also going to be talking about what happens when that doesn't develop. And believe it or not, many people are going to say that this has not been a problem for them, that they have the ability to discern, they know how to test the spirit. If that's you, I want you to keep listening because I believe this video will be for you. We've been taught in scripture that we need to discern the fruit and we need to test the spirit. Discern the fruit, test the spirit. And God's been having me talk about this lately. And the ability to, be, to discern the fruit and test the spirit is integral to our ability to come out of Babylon, to be able to identify who is safe, who is of God, and who is not, to be able to remain connected with God, to be able to discern information, whether it's true or whether it's not, whether a person has truth in them or whether they do not. And every single one of us at this point in history has been infected by Babylon. When God says, come out of her, my people, he is speaking to each and every one of us, myself included. I've shared with you in various videos how God has been bringing Babylon out of me, the deceptions and the lies that I ingested in this world and in counterfeit Christianity. So I'm going to talk with you about some of the ways that our design has been thwarted, that our design for developing discernment has been interfered with or manipulated and how this has led us to be vulnerable to ingesting Babylon and how we need to reclaim that design in order to come out of her. We have been designed to be personally accountable and personally attuned because if we're not personally accountable and we're not personally attuned, we're not going to be attuned to the Holy Spirit. So what does it actually mean to be personally attuned? God has modeled us in his own image, and he has given us feelings as God has feelings. In the word, we see that God feels joy. He also feels anger, jealousy, compassion, sadness, grief. We feel all of those feelings because we've been created in his image. We have been modeled after him. And at no point in the word does God ever say that his feelings are bad, that his feelings have no utility. No, he expresses his feelings, whether they are good or whether they are painful. The only feeling that God does not have that he has given to us is a feeling of fear. And the reason why we have that feeling of fear is to alert us that we have stepped too far or that we need to return to him, that we need to return to his protection, his provision, and that we need to do that in faith. Obviously, that feeling would have no utility for him, but it does for us. For him, he can't return to himself. He's not being swayed by this physical flesh or sinful flesh. But he has indeed given us this feeling in order to understand that we need to return to him, that we need to get in close. And when we get in close, we're able to discern what's going on. It's not because of our own carnality that we're able to discern what's going on. It's because of his spirit. It's because we have chosen his spirit. If you think about children, particularly young women who end up in very dangerous situations because they've been taught in the world to discern with their carnality, and they've been taught that there must be evidence for why it is that they feel a particular way, concrete physical evidence, even though we know that sick people will manipulate and feign being good. And so when we deny this design, when we deny what we're feeling, that we feel that fear and that we need to return to God in order to understand what's going on here, why are we feeling this particular way? When we deny that and we get up into our carnality and try to figure things out, well, he's being nice. No, he's being cool. He's being a good guy. He told me that he respects me. He told me that he understands my values. And yet I have this feeling that I'm denying. I have this intuitive sense that is God-given and right and is in my design, but the world has told me to reject that and deny it. And now I'm in danger. So we've received many messages in the world that are contrary to the design that we hold. And these 
messages are insidiously embedded in everything we've been taught in this world. Everything that is valued, that has been established by the prince of this world, right down to the fact that you cannot make a claim about the way that you feel or about your experience without someone belittling your feelings and asking you, where is the evidence for that? Your testimony, your experience, your sense, your feelings don't matter in this world. And the reason they don't matter is not because there's not utility to them within the design that God has given you, is not because they're not valued by God, because your testimony is, has been valid since the beginning of the Old Testament to the end of the New. And you don't need to produce concrete evidence for that. The only reason you feel insecure about it is because of what the enemy has planted in the world in order to belittle and devalue the things that are important to God. Another way that this happens is during childhood. And this is perhaps one of the most important places. If you don't have a parent who is grounded in truth and in God, who is the only source of truth, that is going to produce children who end up deceived. And so over time, generation upon generation, our design has been thwarted to the point that we were born into this deception, that we perceive truth, that we discern safety in our carnality, that truth and evidence must be perceived and produced in our carnality by only that which is seen, by only that which is measurable. And then you go to school and this is reinforced. You study the things that the world holds as truth in the sciences, and that's reinforced. Only that which is measurable. That's the measurement of knowledge. That's the measurement of evidence. And that is held up in the world. When you have a child who is growing up in a situation in which they are forced to deny the design that God has given them to feel, to sense, and to return to him. That child's design is thwarted. So I'm going to start with an extreme example, and then I'm going to give you a very common example. A more extreme example would be in an abusive situation in which a child is forced to take on the feelings of the parent, to manage the feelings of the parent, because that parent never learned how to manage their own feelings. And because that parent was also abused, they perpetuate that abuse onto their child. They act that out onto their child because they have not resolved it. We've talked about that as being the compulsion to repeat that when a person has been abused and they do not resolve their unresolved suffering, they will act that out on people who are weaker than them who have no choice in the matter. They will require their children to shut down their own feelings in order to manage theirs. They will force their child to be responsible for their feelings. And then when that child is incapable of doing that, they will blame them. Forcing that child into a state of flesh compulsion to be vigilant and constantly afraid. And what did I tell you fear is for? Fear is an indication to return to God. But because that child fears the parent more, they, have to, they are forced into a situation to make that parent their God. And so they flail around trying to satisfy that parent trying to appease them, trying to not unsettle them because they believe that that parent's feelings are their fault because they have been taught that that parent's feelings are their fault. And what is this going to do to that child eventually? Because they are not able to attune to their own feelings and must be attuned to the feelings of the parent at all times for their own safety or perceived safety. Now they have cut off from their own feelings and therefore cut off from being able to be attuned to the Holy Spirit, because if you're not attuned to yourself, you can't be attuned to him. And they are not developing the capacity to relate with themselves or to have personal attunement or personal responsibility. They have been made and forced to be attuned to another person and to be made responsible for another person. It is an insidious attack and an insidious trick. That is actually a fairly common example, but I'm going to give you another common example. When a child grows up in a home where they are not taught how to relate with their feelings, their feelings are not acknowledged, they don't get to talk about them, they don't get to express them, they don't get to learn how to relate with them, 
they are told essentially to pick themselves up by their bootstraps, keep it moving, or think through their feelings, which is even worse. That's something that we're taught in therapy, cognitive behavioral therapies to develop constructs over the way that you feel. Well, people have it worse than me. I need to just be grateful. That is a construct that's built over pain so that you never relate with what God has sent, so that you're not built by what God has sent. Contrary to these ideas that our feelings have no utility and that our brain is all powerful, that we should just think through these things and develop constructs, God actually wants us to feel our grief. He actually gave us feelings for a reason. It's not some anomaly or mutation in our design. He did it by intention. And we know that because he expresses his feelings and he processes through his feelings and he makes decisions based on that process. And by the way, we are commanded to become like him, not by the world. So many parents think that they're doing right by their children by doing these things. But, oh, you feel sad. You know what? Why don't we take the day and we'll go get an ice cream and we'll go shopping. Where's the feelings? Where's the process? Where's the help and the shepherding and the witnessing? I mean, it sounds like a nice thing to spend time with mom, but now I learn that the way that I deal with upset feelings is to eat and to shop and distract myself from the way that I feel. We need to be able to have logical responses to what's going on with us and a logical response to what we're feeling as children, by the way, not as adults. We don't impose this on someone else. If you didn't develop this, join the club. That's the reason why I use the method that I do so that you can develop it because you've got to develop it in yourself. You cannot require someone else to do that for you, whether it's the parent who didn't do it for you or it's a partner that you're now imposing that on. So I teach you how to do that in Heart Known series. No one's going to be able to do it for you. What I'm helping you to understand is one, how to be a parent to your own children, which really is going to come from you doing this within yourself. Otherwise, inevitably, you're going to act this out on your children. But you need to have understanding of where this comes from, and you need to have an understanding of an ideal of what's supposed to happen. That ideal is, I'm not speaking psychobabble right now. This is not coming from psychology because psychology doesn't acknowledge God. This is coming from understanding of what God has established, what he has said, what he has set an example of. And so a logical response to a child who's suffering is to witness and to shepherd. What does he do with us? He witnesses and he shepherds and he builds our testimony That's what we're doing with our children. And we're not doing it perfectly, and we need to let them know that we're not doing it perfectly. And how do we let them know that? We let them know through our own testimony, through sharing with them, you know, I don't have all the answers, and you know that I make mistakes constantly, but here's my experience with this. And if we don't have experience with that, then we just stay with witnessing and sharing God's word. And then we need to go build our testimony. We need to go receive that from God because we should have some sort of experience and testimony to share with our children. Now, I want to tell you that when you are sharing in that way with your children, rather than shutting them down for their imperfections or pretending like we have all the answers, when we're sharing with them, look, I don't have any of the answers. You know that. You've seen that I am imperfect. But here's my experience with this. You are building respect and rapport. You are placing yourself in the humble position of servant to your child. You are pulling yourself out of what the world has taught you, which is to set yourself up as an idol in the place of God. And it frees your child up to see that you are imperfect and that they need a God who is perfect and that you have set yourself below God in the correct position And as a shepherd to God, that you're saying, I'm not perfect, but here's my experience with God. Here's my experience with what he's built in me. Now your child is able to see things correctly, knowing that you are not perfect, that you are not God, that you are trudging this the same way that they are trudging it. And they're able to understand the journey 
And now they're able to transition from having set you up as the authority in their life to setting him up as the authority in their life. You're sharing in an authentic way, in a genuine way, in heart and spirit based on the ministry of God in your own life. And in order for you to have the ministry of God in your own life, you have to be attuned to your feelings and your experiences. That is correct parenting. That is true shepherding. And God is going to teach you how to do that first in your own house. And then he will bring you into doing that with others. Then you will be activated in the purpose for which he has set you apart in the larger body of Christ. But you got to do it correctly in your individual house. Then in, my dog is snoring. I'm sorry if you can hear her in the background. In your individual house, receiving his ministry, the building of your testimony in you as an individual, then within your family, so your house, the house that extends beyond you, and then in the larger house, in the body of Christ. If it's not in that order, it's not happening correctly. Your own house has to be in order, in order for you to impact correctly the house that he has set you over, and then the body of Christ, his house. You cannot manage God's house. You cannot manage God's church if you are not yet above reproach, if you are not yet above question, if you have not handled and managed your own house correctly. And if you as an individual house don't have the proper development to be personally attuned. You won't be attuned to God. You won't be receiving from him. Therefore, you will not be built by him. And you will not be able to do that likewise with your children. This is the reason why I teach the method that I do in Heart Known series. It's not because it's some sort of psychobabble treatment or something like that. And it's also, I want you to understand, not what's going to heal you. It is what you are required to do in personal responsibility. So please don't treat Heart Known Series and what is taught in there as some sort of treatment that you, by the work of your own hands, are going to somehow achieve. Because if you're not doing it correctly, it will be one more treatment that you will labor in vain on. You have to understand it for what it is. Treatments have no utility in the kingdom of God. Treatments claim that they heal you. What you are doing in Heart Known Series is you are taking personal responsibility for what is required in you, what's required in you in order to examine, in order to be built, in order to soothe yourself so that you're capable of getting into the heart and spirit to receive God's ministry. Just because you do all those things doesn't even mean you're going to heal. You have to do all of those things in order to bring yourself correctly to him and receive him and the ministry that he will give you, that he will impart, the ways that he's going to talk with you, the ways that he's going to build you and give you understanding. So if that's not happening, the work is not being done correctly. If you're just stopping at the part of soothing yourself and all of these other things and you're not actually sitting in his counsel and asking him the questions that you have and listening for his ministry, then you're not doing it right and you're not going to heal because truly he is the only one who can heal you and seal you, seal those chinks in your armor where the enemy has been slithering in. Now let's go back to this topic of discernment because we need to understand some of the things that led to us ingesting counterfeit Christianity, ingesting these things in the world. I mean, for the most part, we were forced into it, right? We were forced into it through mandatory indoctrination, in mandatory education, being forced to just sort of accept what other people say to us, including our parents. That's a very common parenting strategy because I said so. Assuming that children are inherently evil because they ask questions, that that is somehow disobedient, 
No, you know what's disobedient is a lazy parent who won't answer those questions and live in the authority that God has given them. Because I said so is lazy and wicked. We do have a responsibility to help our children to understand the reasons why we do things. We also have the responsibility to discern when they're being disobedient. But the assumption that a child is being disobedient because they're asking a question is ridiculous. And what it has led to is are people who end up in cults and placidly accept whatever is told to them without asking questions of why is this important to God? That's not a disobedient question. That's a good question. It's a question that a child asks. Why is this important to your heart? If I love you, I want to know. Why is it important that you want me to wear a purple shirt on Tuesday? I don't get it, but can you tell me why so that I can understand? And then once I understand, it's going to be easier for me to obey because now I know your heart and I love you and I want to please you. But if it doesn't make sense to me and now I'm just obeying because you said so, what do you think that's going to lead to? Later on down the road, as I develop in the world, I'm just going to follow orders, orders that don't make sense, orders that come from unsafe, wicked people. I'm going to ingest their false doctrines and false gospels. I'm going to obey even when it doesn't make sense. And something that I had a wonderful experience yesterday to have a conversation with someone who had felt hurt by something that I said. And the person wasn't going to bring it up. They weren't going to talk with me about it. And I'm so grateful that they did because what it provided was an opportunity for each of us to have clarity around where, what we were, each of us was feeling in the conversation, why it was that I said things the way that I did. It helped me to understand their heart and how I might need to talk with them in the future. It gave them personal responsibility for saying this really hurt me. And what they said to me was that they knew that what I was saying was correct, that God had testified to it, and that they just needed to obey. And what I will say to that is I'm glad that God testified to it. Nevertheless, it is very important that when we feel hurt, that we go and try and examine that hurt, that we're not, you know, saying, oh, you hurt my feelings, because really, we don't know yet and have not discerned yet where that person was coming from or whether what they did was wrong. So we have to go and examine, all right, where's this coming from? Is, is there something historical that this is playing on? For example, if I'm not feeling understood by the other person, is that a historical thing for me that I need to now go work through? And then once I've worked through that with God, it will become clear. I will know whether I need to go back to that person and have a conversation and say, you know, I realized some of this is coming from my past or whatever it is. But I also want want to make sure that you understand this piece. And what that does is it allows us to have relationship, to have true and genuine relationships with people in which We're taking responsibility for our stuff and we're able to separate what's coming from our past and what's coming from the current situation. Sometimes we don't need to address it at all, but sometimes we do. And if we don't go through that process, we run the risk of receiving from people and obeying people who are not good, who are not from God, who are going to exploit us and who are telling us things for their own benefit rather than for the benefit of God's kingdom and his truth. And this is a, it's a risk when we're not doing that. We're not going through that process and we're just simply obeying and don't yet understand or haven't gone through a process of um, discerning by God's spirit, asking him, should I have a conversation with this person? Is there a conversation that's needed? And truly, for me, I felt closer to the person for having had that conversation. And I think they did too. And I think that I remember them saying that it felt good to have that conversation. 
You know, the other thing that comes out of that when we've been hurt and we've gone and done our own work and then we have that converse, those conversations with people is we give them an opportunity to show us who they are, whether they can be corrected, whether how they're going to share, well, here's what I was feeling in that situation and how they respond to us. Now, let me give you a caveat. If you have not done your personal work and you go and confront someone, you're going to attack them and you're going to place your personal accountability all over them. So don't be surprised when they don't react well or when they ignore what you're saying because that's a lack of personal accountability. But I'm talking about something different. I'm talking about when you've gone and you've done this and then you, have, and then you bring that to them accountably. Now, your confidence is in what you received from God. And so if that person is not able to have an effective conversation with you, if they're not able to examine themselves and care about you and respond with love, now you know who they are. So these things are really, it's really important that we're engaging in relationships in a true way, in the way that God has designed us. And remember that it starts first in your individual house, then it extends to the house he's put you over, and then it extends to the body of Christ. Got to go in that order. If it doesn't go in that order, you're doing it wrong. So if you have not dealt with what's in your individual house, you have no business having conversations. So placid obedience is not something that God requires. That has been taught in counterfeit Christianity that children are just supposed to obey. And you know what that does? It frustrates a child when they don't understand and they haven't been respected and they haven't been heard and they haven't been cared about. It frustrates children. And God has commanded us not to frustrate our children, nor has he commanded us to do things that he will not explain. He explains according to our ability to understand. Even, you know, I would say that probably if someone were to argue against this, they would say, well, what about the sacrifices? People didn't understand the fulfillment of that. Well, yeah, they didn't understand the fulfillment of it. We are, we are tasked with understanding more than those of the Old Testament. But even in the Old Testament, there was enough that was explained to the developmental stage of the church. They did understand that they were to engage in these rituals and that those rituals had to do with cleansing and had to do with cleansing their sin. And yet we, being tasked with understanding the fulfillment of that, don't even understand the basic building blocks because we think that we're a New Testament church, not an Old Testament church. I actually heard someone refer to the New Testament gospel as though it's somehow separate from the Old Testament. That's ridiculous. The New Testament gospel is the fulfillment of the Old Testament gospel. And there's no way for us to understand fulfillment if we don't understand the initial commands. We don't understand what's even being fulfilled. So God has absolutely given us the explanation. He continues to give us the explanation and wisdom as we pursue his heart and his spirit. He will give us understanding. But you know what he says? For those who don't care about his heart, then this will just be do this and do that. It will just be a list of rules. For those who don't care about truth, for those who don't love him, because if you love him, you pursue his heart. If you love a human being, you're pursuing their heart. You're wanting to understand what what do they love? What's important to them? You're listening. And so if we're just approaching his word as, okay, what are the 10 commands? What's the checklist? We will have no understanding. His covenant will become do this and do that, and we won't fulfill it. So part of our responsibility is to test the spirit and discern the fruit. The only way that we can do that is through God's Holy Spirit. I've demonstrated for you that doing this by our carnality, doing it in the way with the false gospel that the world has set up, that our feelings are not important, only our 
only the things of our flesh are, right? Our cognitions and our behaviors, the mind and body that are the flesh in, the, in, in which we're supposed to be disciplined according to the heart and spirit as the heart and spirit are conformed to God who speaks with our spirit and is in our heart. But the world says, no, live in the flesh. That's where the power is in the mind and body. Baloney. You know what? You know what's in there? The mind and body are weak. The flesh is weak, but the spirit is willing. And so if you want to live in God, you have to live in the spirit, in your spirit, by his spirit. And he's cleansing your heart and you're, he's disciplining your flesh. But if you choose to live in that place that the world tells you has power in the mind and body, in the flesh that's supposed to be disciplined according to him, you will be living according to the world. You will become conformed to the world. If you choose to treat his covenant as a list of do's and don'ts, do this and do that, a rule for this, a rule for that, you won't even do it right. You will become conformed to the pattern of the world because that's what the flesh does. The physical flesh is vulnerable. It is weak to the sinful flesh. We don't discern by our carnality. It is a false gospel and it is intended to keep you unsafe and compelled in your flesh. So if you don't have the development of one who knows how to discern by being in contact with your feelings and your design, personally attuned, you won't be able to connect with the Holy Spirit who discerns, who discerns the fruit and tests the spirit in others. A child who doesn't have that a child who grew up in a situation, for example, in that severe example where they had to live in the flesh, they were forced to live in the flesh to take care of someone else's feelings, to be responsible for something that they could never even really tr- be responsible for. And there, therein lies a huge satanic trick because they're compelled constantly and never able to actually attain that goal. They're constantly failing because that parent is constantly blaming them for not making it better because they can't make it better. They've been given a task that is impossible for them to accomplish. And it leaves them exquisitely vulnerable to later as an adolescent, because as a child, you can just continue to sort of flail around. And then as an adolescent, you start thinking about these things. And when you can't make sense of them, That fantasy that you lived in as a young child of I'm going to be able to, if I'm just good enough and I please mom or dad, when you can no longer live in that fantasy, but then you're at this crossroads of being an adolescent and you're thinking about these things and trying to figure out how to discern, how to live life, how to please another person, how to discern the fruit of another person and test who they are, you're going to need something else, something salient in order to live in the fantasy that you were taught. It's no longer going to be enough for you to just live in the fantasy that you can please mom or dad, because now you have this ability to think about it, but you're confused and you can't figure it out. And so you're going to be vulnerable to doing things to disconnect from that chaotic confusion inside of you. You're going to do things like use drugs or alcohol in order to facilitate the fantasy, to over-focus on the needs of others, get lost in the needs of others. That'll be your drug. To overeat, to undereat, to over-control, to start living through your own children. Anything that you can do to separate from yourself because you've not learned to live there. And you need to understand what you're doing. You're separating from your own feelings that you have not learned to relate with. And you are using other things as drugs to facilitate a fantasy. A fantasy that you were forced to live in as a child. Some other world that you had to create in order to separate from yourself. Because now you've shut down your design and the Holy Spirit from ever having 
a chance of permeating your awareness, of being able to speak to you. You're under a different spirit. You're under the influence of a different spirit. And it's easy for that spirit to destroy you. You don't have to be using drugs or alcohol to be under the influence of a different spirit. Drugs and alcohol certainly facilitate it in a very salient and powerful way. But living in your flesh and distracting yourself with things of your flesh, such as the desire to control the work of your hands, overindulgence, under eating, which comes from a desire to control. The minute you choose the desires of the flesh, you are under the influence of a different spirit. This relates to all kinds of addictions, not just alcohol and drugs, but most profoundly alcohol and drugs. Nevertheless, we've seen all kinds of powerful denials and disconnections in people who use food, porn, even repression theology. Now, what do I mean by that? A theology that teaches you to repress your feelings, your very design that God has given you. How many have, of you have heard people preaching this in counterfeit Christianity, diminishing, degrading your feelings, the very design that God has given you, the very feelings that God feels, degrading it. And why do you think they do that? Because they don't relate with their own feelings. And if they don't relate with their own feelings, if they are degrading the very thing that God cherishes, the very design he has given you, the very place that you feel where God's spirit was placed in your heart, communicating with your spirit, why do you think they're degrading that? I'll tell you why. Because they're scared of it themselves. Because they have not healed. And so they teach you in a superficial way to repress your feelings, your design, your intuition, your experience has no business in, in the church of God. Vodi Bakum is one who's notorious for preaching this. Your testimony doesn't matter. Teaching you a script of how you're supposed to defend your faith. Even though God, from the very beginning of, of the Old Testament to the end of the New, talks about the importance of testimony. And if people can't hear that, that doesn't matter. They haven't been given the ears to hear. But your testimony, your experience matters in the kingdom of God. Your feelings matter in the kingdom of God. It's part of the way that God's speaking to you. If our feelings don't matter, then God's feelings don't matter. And that just isn't so. And what that leads to are people who do what they think they should do in a superficial way. Again, a rule for this, a rule for that, a little here, a little there, and they will fall. An example of this is to love and be kind. The distortion of what counterfeit Christianity thinks that means not looking at the example of what was demonstrated to us because, you know, experience doesn't matter. Testimony doesn't matter. Only the words, right? Only the words and the rules matter. Only what we think matters. Only what's in our carnality and what we can see and measure. That's a combination of the world and what people think Christianity is. Those are the teachings of the world. And it's no wonder why counterfeit Christianity has evolved to a point that they define by their carnality, love and kindness to mean tolerating bad behavior, bad fruit, addictions, abusive and disrespectful children, to not hold people accountable, to not turn and rebuke, to not teach people what repentance actually is that they must turn from their wicked ways, that it is not God's will for them to have an addiction for the rest of their life, to identify themselves as the world identifies themselves as an addict, as depressed, as anxious, as having a syndrome and a diagnosis. It's not God's will and it's not God's design. And it's not his will that we accommodate to that. It's his will that we teach correctly. 
personal accountability, personal attunement, and what is required in order for us to heal and be done with it. But repression theology, satanic repression theology that tells you to stay in your carnality, in your thoughts, and not to care about your feelings, your heart, keeps you from being attuned to yourself and therefore keeps you from being attuned to the Holy Spirit. This is the very reason why Vody Bauckham and John MacArthur claim that people don't hear from God the way they used to. Not in the Bible I'm reading. The Bible I'm reading says that we were given the Holy Spirit to hear from God the way that the prophets of old did. The Bible I'm reading says that we're going to prophesy. Sons and daughters are going to prophesy in the last days. Old men are going to dream dreams. Young men are going to see visions. Why are Vody Bauckham and John MacArthur not hearing from God? Because they teach placid obedience to man and repressive theology. They teach in opposition to the word of God. That your testimony doesn't matter. That your design doesn't matter. That you being in the image of God doesn't matter. And that you're not hearing from God. That you must hear from them. Because by their carnality, they're dispensing a message from God. How is that possible when God says he hates the flesh? They are liars whose consciences are seared, who preach a message for themselves because they are greedy for gain and they speak on their own authority for their own glory and there is no truth in them. And this is the predicament that we are in these thousands of years later, that we don't know what love and kindness are, that we coddle people all the way to hell, that we set ourselves up as idols and gods, and we don't teach people about their design, and we don't humble ourselves below God, beneath him, as a shepherd to him, because all are greedy for gain, prophets and priests alike. They tear the meat off of his people and feed themselves. And they say, praise the Lord, we are rich. And because you don't know how to attune to yourself, to your own feelings, to your own design, you have not been able to attune to the Holy Spirit. You have not been able to discern the fruit, test the spirit, and test it according to the word of God. Because if people were actually doing that in Babylon, in counterfeit Christianity, they would say what I just said to you, that when these people are saying these things, it is standing against these places in scripture, in the word of God. If they were speaking truth, it would line up, but it's not. It's not lining up with the word of God and it's not lining up with the example of God or the testimony of Christ. It's not lining up. They have abandoned their responsibility for example, for first cleaning up their own house, their individual house, cleaning up the house over which they preside and then in the body of Christ. So they don't dispense a true teaching they don't set an example. They don't have relationships with you that are real or true. And this has to begin in the home. If our children are to understand these things, it has to begin in the home. It has to begin in parents who manage their individual house so that they are able to set an example for the house over whom they preside, over whom they've been given authority so that they can teach correctly, so that they can have proper relationships in which they are humbled. Even more than their children, they're humbled because they're poured out as a shepherd, just as Christ is poured out and more humble than the church. That's why our children are not learning. That's why we didn't learn. That's why the, the counterfeit Christianity is not learning because these things are not being done in our individual houses, in the houses over whom we preside. So how can they manage the house of God? How can the house of God be healed? Why 
is there no healing for the daughter of God's people? Why does he refer to these people as worthless shepherds? Why do these worthless shepherds diminish and degrade the feelings and experiences, the testimony that are required for the testimony that God is building in us? Because when this is done, when relationship is real and true and parents are hearing their child's feelings and experiences and talking with them and sharing their own testimony and their own feelings and experiences, then children are able to understand their impact. When parents who have children who step out of line a little bit and they start to become abusive and disrespectful and that parent sits down with their child and they speak truly to them and they have a true relationship and they say, this is how I feel when you're talking with me that way. Your behavior impacts me rather than just smacking them across the face and taking away their phone so that they hate their parent even more and disrespect them and they just bide their time until it rises back up out of them again. Why don't parents have relationships with their children this way? Why aren't they having conversations with them that reflect the way that they're impacted by their children so that their children are able to have empathy and compassion. Why are they not listening to the feelings and experiences of their children and how they are impacting their children? That's what love and kindness are, you guys. Holding one another accountable with truth, with authenticity, with humility, with vulnerability, so that we each develop love and compassion and empathy for one another. We care about the way that we're impacted. We care about the way that Our house is being affected by what goes on with each member of the house. We don't tolerate bad behavior, bad fruit. We lift each other. We build each other up in truth and compassion and accountability. And when we do that individually and then over the house on which we preside, we're going to learn how to do that in the body of Christ. And that's going to come out in our behavior, not because we made a decision about our behavior, but because that's what's in our heart, because we have true understanding that is coming out of us through our deeds, through our thoughts and what we declare. So again, I go back to that example of talking with someone yesterday about having, about their feelings being hurt by something that I said, if you're not sharing your feelings in relationship You're not having a relationship. You're not allowing yourself to be humbled. You're not allowing yourself to be vulnerable and truthful. You're not allowing others to show you who they are, to understand their impact on you. You're not allowing others to be impacted by you. That's a relationship. Again, this doesn't mean that you're processing with that person. It means that you processed with God and now you're sharing with that person. You process with God, then with others. And in this way, you're bringing God into all of your relationships. You are providing an opportunity for God to be glorified in the weakness that he sent. This video has covered a lot of territory, but I wanted you to understand the development of discernment, the process of discernment, why it's important, how it happens. It does not happen in our carnality. God does not tell us ever once to live in our carnality. He wants us to live in the heart and spirit. Our carnality is not capable of being disciplined. It fights against the spirit of God. He would never tell us to live there. We have to live in the place that is willing, which is the spirit, in the place that is being cleansed from where all things will come, from where our right hand, our forehead, and our mouth, our deeds, our thoughts, and our declarations are going to come That's where we need to live, our heart, where God's spirit was placed, where he moves us to follow his laws and be careful to keep his decrees. When would God ever tell us to live in our cognitions, our behaviors, our carnality? Never. Your testimony matters. Your feelings matter. But you need to understand your design in order to heal and in order to discern. 
You need to understand your design for personal accountability and personal attunement in order for you to then be able to bring yourself to God correctly, be attuned to his spirit, and receive his ministry. Otherwise, you will not hear from him. And you'll start making up ideas, as counterfeit Christianity has, about God, about healing, about theology, about a false gospel. That's the predicament we're in today. And in order for you to be able to discern and come out of Babylon and, br- and for God to bring Babylon out of you, you got to learn how to be d- attuned to his spirit. And so I recommend that all of you do a fast. If you're not experiencing this already, that you do a fast, that you return to him, that you ask him how to be attuned, that you check out Heart Known series if that's what he places on your heart to do, but it's got to come from him. And that you pray to be brought into truth, that you pray for deception to be brought out of you, for you to be brought out of deception, and for you to be able to have clear spiritual eyes. I really pray that this happens for each and every one of you. God bless you. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you in the next video.